In this video, we go through the various stages of compilation, which include lexical analysis, syntax analysis, code generation, and optimization. So as programmers, we write source code, and that's close to English, and it's easy to read, modify, and interpret by humans. As we already know though, a processor cannot run source code, it needs to be first turned into machine code. During the compilation process, a compiler runs through a series of what are known as parses. With each parse, the compiler performs different actions on the source code. Each parse is designed to carry out, set tasks, and prepare the code for the next stage of compilation. The four stages of compilation you're required to know about are lexical analysis, syntax analysis, code generation, and code optimization. Let's look at them now in a little more detail. So the first stage is lexical analysis. The Lexus starts by converting lexemes in the source code into a series of tokens. Now we can see the original source code here for a very simple function on the left. As the Lexa reads the source code, it literally scans the code letter by letter. When it encounters a white space, an operator symbol or a special symbol, it decides that a word, or in this case a lexine, is complete. It then checks if the lexine is valid using a predefined set of rules that allow every lexing to be identified as a valid token. Keywords, constants, identifiers, strings, numbers, operators and punctuation symbols are all considered valid tokens in programming languages. So for our example, we're going to make some simple assumptions. We're going to assume that Alexa creates tokens in the following format. Open square brackets, then a token class, so that's from the left-hand column of our table, followed by a colon, and then the contents of the token, followed by a closed square brackets. So we see here, we the Lexa has discovered the first lexeme. It's looked it up, and it knows this is a keyword. So we've created our token pair down the bottom, square brackets, keyword, colon, function, close square brackets. It then proceeds and reads the next lexeme and it turns that into a token, identifier, colon, check, score. The open bracket is identified as a separator, score as another identifier, as as a keyword, integer as a data type, and the closed parentheses as a separator. If we carry on parsing the whole program, taking each lexeme one at a time, you can see what the program now looks like once it's been turned into a series of tokens. Now let's say you are able to actually pause or stop the compilation process at this point directly after lexical analysis and inspect your code. It will look something similar to the simple screenshot of a text file we've got on the bottom left. You will notice how all the white space and all the comments have been removed from the original source code. Now, some people say that this is actually one of the jobs of the lexical analyzer, that it removes tabbing, white space and comments. And while this is true, it's actually technically more of a side effect to the process. The white space and comments have been removed because they've simply been passed over or skipped by the lexa during this stage of compilation. So now we've created our token streams from the lexemes in the source code, it's time to input those tokens into a symbol table. So for our example, we're again going to make some assumptions. We're going to assume that our Lexa only creates one single symbol table. We're going to assume that it doesn't store any duplicate entries, so we'll remove those tokens. And we're going to use simple indexing here from 0 to 17 instead of hashing. And all of this is just to keep this example nice and simple so you can understand the process. 
You can see now that the first token gets placed into index zero in the symbol table. The same thing happens with the second token. And so on and so forth until our symbol table is complete. You'll notice the data type column here for our symbol table is empty. This is because this is added in the syntax analysis stage, which we're going to look at next. So just before we move on to syntax analysis, we're going to mention a couple of things that aren't strictly in the spec, but are well worth knowing about and are quite interesting. So multiple symbol tables are really created and typically they're done so for each subroutine. Now this is what allows variables to have the same name in a program, but with different scope. The symbol tables may be pre-populated with keywords from the programming language. And a strings table could also be created in addition to the symbol table. This helps to make the subsequent stages of compilation even more efficient and fast. And obviously the symbol table isn't really stored with a simple index of 0 through 17 like we showed. It typically uses a hash table for very efficient lookup in the syntax analysis stage. And we look at hash tables in a much later video. OK, so returning to the process of compilation, syntax analysis is the second phase of the compiler design process and comes directly after lexical analysis. It receives its input in the form of tokens from the lexical analyzer. It analyzes the syntactical structure of the input it's receiving, checking if it's in the correct syntax for the programming language it has been written in. Now it does this by analyzing the token stream against production rules to detect any errors in the code. And doing this accomplishes a couple of tasks. It is able to check for errors and report them back to you. And it also builds what's called an abstract syntax tree or a parse tree. So we already have our token stream created from our lexemes in the original source code. Now we've simplified it here. We've got a single line of source code, dim score as integer, and that's a valid line of source code for declaring a variable in a language called Visual Basic. And we've converted that into a set of tokens there in our symbol table. The lexer couldn't tell us, however, if these tokens were valid within the grammar or syntax of the language but the syntax analyzer can. First of all, we see the word dim in our token stream. We look that up and we can see that this exists. After dim, we must have an identifier and we discover from our token stream that we do. After the identifier, we must have the keyword as, and we discover that we do. And after the keyword as, we discover we must have a data type of either an integer, decimal or string. Now in reality, there'd be a lot more data types than this, but we're keeping it simple. And we discover that the token given next in the stream is indeed an integer. So we've successfully managed to validate the syntax. This line of code has passed the syntax check as it strictly follows the rules for the language. If the check fails, the syntax analyzer can report the failure to the user, letting them know the exact line and location of the error. And with some IDEs, it could even suggest possible corrections. So here's a more complex version. We've got if score is greater than 75, then. But again, you can see we're just following a valid path through this predetermined structure. We've got the keyword if that must be followed by an identifier. It then must be followed by a comparison operator of which there are a number to choose from. This then has to be followed by an identifier or an integer decimal or string and then it must end with the keyword then. We followed through and we can see again, this is a syntactically valid line of code in this language. 
Now, aside from producing errors if the program fails, the main output of this phase of compilation is to create what's known as an abstract syntax tree or parse tree. The abstract syntax tree is created from the original input token stream it gets from the Lexa. As it is created, it is strictly following the syntax diagrams we showed you earlier to check that absolutely everything is 100% correct. When an identifier is added to the abstract syntax tree, the symbol table is checked to see if it exists. The information from the abstract syntax tree can be used to update the data types of the identifiers. So just before we go on to the final stages of compilation, we're just going to throw in a couple of extra points that aren't strictly in the spec, but are quite interesting to know about. So the symbol table may also hold the relative addresses of an identifier as its memory requirements will be known from its data type. So for example, an integer might be two bytes. Some compilers actually do this at the code generation stage we look at in a minute. The memory requirements, however, of dynamic data structures can't be known during compilation. They have to be allocated at runtime from a special area of memory known as the heap. So now let's look at stage three and four, code generation and optimization. In these final phases, the actual machine code is generated. The code is optimized and it attempts to reduce the overall execution time of the finished program file. It does this by spotting redundant instructions and producing object code that achieves the same effect as the source program, but maybe not necessarily in the same means. It removes subroutines that may never be called and removes variables and constants which are never referenced. Code optimization can considerably increase the compilation time for a program. Now, it's useful here to actually give some concrete examples of what do we mean by optimizing your code? Well, at a source code level, the user could write anything they like. We've got four functions on the left here. They all take a single integer X, they add 10 to it, and they return the result. But they all do it in a different number of ways using a different number of lines and declaring different local variables. At a compilation level, the compiler can search for instructions redundant in nature, e.g. multiple loading and storing of instructions may carry the same meaning, even if some of them are removed. The compiler could delete the first instruction and rewrite the line of assembly code as shown here. It's achieving exactly the same thing. Thus, we're making the finished executable code more efficient. We've also got the concept of getting rid of unreachable code. So unreachable code is a part of a program that is never accessed because of varying various programming constructs. Programmers may quite possibly accidentally write a piece of code which is unable ever to be executed. So in this code segment, the print statement will never be reached. Program control returns at the previous line before the print line can ever be executed, resulting in the code optimizer simply removing this print line from the finished executable machine code. And finally, another way of optimizing code is what's called flow or control optimization. So there are instances in code where the program control jumps back and forth without performing any significant task. If the optimizer spots this, these jumps can be removed. So in this example, label one can be removed as it simply passes control to label two. So instead of jumping to label one and then two, the control can be optimized to go directly to label two. It's the same effect, but with more efficient code. So on the screen now is a nice, simple, high-level summary 
of the four stages of the compilation process and the main tasks or operations that are performed at each. You might like to pause the video here and take some quick notes. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. What happens during the different phases of compilation?